Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, and welcome to SNAM's 2018 interim results presentation. In the first half of the year, we made strong progress in executing our strategy. We continue to deliver solid net income growth driven by our investment plan, the increased contribution of high margin regulated services, our efforts on efficiency, and a 15% decrease in net interest costs. We also continue to grow our business through our domestic CapEx plan and signed an agreement with SGI for the joint realization, subject to the relevant approvals, of the gas transport infrastructure in Sardinia. The regulatory environment for our Italian business continues to be constructive, with two new consultation documents published. This in a context where underlying gas demand, net of extraordinary effects, continues to grow, especially in the industrial segment. SNAM has also continued to expand its presence in the energy transition. In the first half of the year, we acquired three highly technological companies in the renewable gas, sustainable mobility, and energy efficiency sectors for an overall investment of about 40 million euros. In the first half of the year, we returned more than 900 million euros to shareholders through the payment of our dividends and the ongoing buyback program. Taking a closer look at our financial results, revenues grew by 4% thanks to the increase in the asset base, the acquisition of Infrastrutture Trasporto Gas in Italy, and the output-based incentive on the balancing activities. EBITDA was up 2.8%. Efficiencies continued to offset the merger the synergies and labor cost inflation, while the overall cost base also includes new activities and some one-off costs. Net income was up 3.8%, also thanks to the solid income from associates of 85 million euros, including Etel Gas and Adriatic LNG. The strong cash flow generation driven by the positive results and the working capital benefits more than offset investments and the cash return to shareholders, leading to an overall reduction in net debts. Looking at our associates in more detail, our international businesses continue to perform well. In the first half of the year, TAG completed its refinancing, increasing the average maturity of its debt from two to six years. Derega, formerly TIGF, recently received confirmation from Moody's that its rating would be BAA2 with less stringent thresholds, benefiting now from a fully regulated status and therefore leaving room for further capital structure optimization. The contribution of Interconnector UK reflects our increased stake in the company since March this year, and capacity auctions on this capacity are proceeding well. These companies, which we account for using the equity method, together provided 64 million euro, uh, euros of net income in the first half. As a reference, our pro quota share of their EBITDA would have been 175 million euros in the first half of the year. Turning now to the evolution of the regulatory environment, the government has published its nominations for the new board of the regulator, which will be voted by two-thirds of the relevant parliamentary committees. All five of the proposed members have high-level competences and a strong track record. Meanwhile, the outgoing regulator has published two consultation documents. With regards to the fifth regulatory period, which will start in 2020, the document includes an explicit reference to the growing importance of natural gas in Italy's energy mix, a two-year extension of incentives for new development capex, a positive stance on output-based incentives to encourage performance in areas such as quality of service and the greening of the energy system, which will which will be defined through further specific consultation. It also includes the inclusion of work in progress in the RAB calculation and the transition towards TOTEX being postponed to after the fifth regulatory period, which means after 2023. The, the second document, which is the cost benefit methodology, uh, is consistent with international best practices, in particular with the NSOG methodology to calculate both the costs and the benefits of additional infrastructure. Meanwhile, 
with regards to the update on the risk-free rate, the country risk premium, the gearing, and tax rate parameters used in the formula to calculate our WAC, we are now 10 months into the 12 months observation period, and it seems reasonable at this stage to expect remuneration levels at least in line with today. Turning now to our non-regulated activities, TAP is around 75% complete, and we confirm our expectation for first gas in 2020. Recently, EIB and EBRD have approved loans to the project for more than 2 billion euros, and negotiations with commercial banks are progressing well, and we expect TAP to close the financing and therefore pay the true up to its shareholders by the end of the year. Looking now at the role of gas in Europe's long-term energy policies, we're continuing to work on an integrated energy transition strategy, which will provide new revenues and enhance the long-term prospects for gas infrastructure. The value of renewable gas and existing infrastructure to decarbonize Europe is becoming increasingly clear. A recent study conducted by ECOFIS and a group of leading TSOs, including SNAM, concluded that renewable gas production in Europe could amount to over 120 billion cubic meters per year on a conservative basis, and that leveraging this green gas in a deeply decarbonized system would save consumers around 140 billion euros per year at run rate compared to a no-gas system. These numbers, which are large and significant, yet don't include the significant savings that would come from transport and industry. So they're only focused on power generation and heating. SNAM is committed to playing an increasing role in this transition, particularly by supporting the growth of green gas and sustainable mobility. Looking more closely at these objectives, biomethane in Italy has a material potential. We have received a total of over 750 preliminary inquiries to connect biomethane plants to our network. In this context, we decided to acquire 70% of YES Biogas, which is a world leader in the design, building, and management of biogas and biomethane plants and has already worked on 200 existing plants in Italy. One of the most promising uses of biomethane is in the transport sector, also supported by a specific decree and incentive scheme in Italy, which applies to about 1 billion cubic meters for 10 years. Gas for light transport is already large and is a growing market in Italy with over 1 million CNG cars on the road already. In the first half, SNAM received 141 requests to connect new CNG stations to the grid, while vehicle registrations were 60% higher year-on-year, -year, driven by new models available. In July, we opened our first CNG station, and we have contracts for 40 more of which 20 have been signed yesterday with ANI. We have also signed yesterday a new framework agreement with API, which is a number two player in Italy. In the sector, we're leveraging an integrated offer thanks to the Kubogas acquisition. LNG for heavy and maritime transport is also a very interesting market, expected to grow to around three BCM by 2030. We're making progress on our feasibility study to build four micro liquefaction plants in Italy for an overall investment of between 50 and 80 million euros and for total capacity of between 150 and 200 million cubic meters per year. These plants will produce LNG drawing gas from our infrastructure and will be based in regions where they will be more competitive than the alternative imported LNG. Energy efficiency will also play a growing role in the energy transition. In order to leverage our in-house capabilities and offer new savings to industrial, residential customers and to the public sector, we acquired 82% of TEP Energy Solutions, a leading Italian ESCO. So summing up, the strong progress we've made in the first half of the year means that we can revise our guidance upwards for the full year. Our net income guidance, which was 975 million euros, is now around 1 billion. Year-end net debt guidance is confirmed at 11.5 billion euro, which is an improvement compared to the previous guidance because it now includes 160 million euros of acquisitions as well 
as a buyback already executed and is partly offset by strong cash generation supported by working capital. Please consider that the buyback within the approved plan of 500 million euros is expected to continue in the second part of the year. The strong progress on our efficiency and cost-cutting program enables us to increase our target savings by 25% to 2021. We will present a strategic update in November to provide progress on our core business, also in light of the update of the WAC and additional visibility on our new activities. Thank you for your attention. I will now hand over to Alessandra for a closer look at our first half results. Thank you, Marco. Looking more closely at our cost-cutting plan, in the first six months of the year, we continued the reduction in external costs relating to corporate services and consultancies, and we launched some additional activities, including the assessment for the data center usage optimization and a benchmark study on start maintenance costs. Moreover, on the ICT front, we are moving forward in our plan to migrate <coughs> a part of our data center workload to the cloud, and we have started insourcing some key capabilities in the digital transformation space. With regard to operations, the project to integrate O&M dispatching and commercial activities between our transport and storage business has been completed as is providing benefits. Thanks to the better than expected results obtained so far, we're able to target more than 30 million euro savings by year end and to increase the target for the plan from 40 to over 50 million euro by 2021. In addition, we are continuing with our approach of seeking efficiencies and working to identify new possible sources of savings. EBIT in the first half was 729 million euro, up 15 million euro over the same period of the prior year. This number reflects the increase in regulated revenues for 47 million, mainly due to the increase in tariff rub, the inclusion of infrastructure at Transporto Gas, and a gradual ramp up in regulated services for 7 million euro. The cost-cutting plan just commented deliver further 6 million euro in the first half of the year, out of which five are on the, corporate, on the controllable fixed costs, allowing us to offset labor cost inflation and the residual impact of the merger the synergies. The increase in controllable fixed cost of 4 million euro is mainly due to, the, to infrastructure transport to gas costs, which was not part of the perimeter in the first half of last year, and is expected to be essentially fully absorbed by 2019 and the insourcing of some uh, ICT costs uh, together with some security costs. Depreciation was up 14 million euro, reflecting the growing RAD. Other components mainly include non-regulated revenues related to lower sale of materials for uh, about 3 million euro, uh, a couple of million euro related to new activities and new business ramp up, 1 million non-cash share buyback fees, and 5 million for one-off transactional costs and net provisions. Net profit for the first half 2018 was 523 million euro, up 19 million euro compared to last year. This was driven by the positive performance of our operations, lower net interest expenses for 17 million euro, thanks to the benefit of uh, last year liability management, pre-funding activities completed last year, earlier in this year, and treasury optimization carried out during the first six months. Slightly lower contribution from associate, mainly due to the expected contribution of Terega storage business, which has become regulated, thus completely de-risking the business and providing long-term visibility. Higher taxes due to higher earning before tax. Tax rate for the period was around 27% on EBT. Let's now look at our debt structure and provide an update on our cost of debt. Our average cost of debt in the first half was already 1.6%, which is below our previous guidance of 1.8%, thanks to the funding actions completed in the first half of 2018, uh, such as the 350 two-year bond issues in January at negative yield, the continued strong treasury management optimization effort, and the expiry of a 3 0.875% 850 million euro bond. As a result, we are upgrading our cost of debt guidance to 1.6 for the full year. Regarding the gross debt breakdown, at the end of the first half, the fixed rate portion was 73% in line with our guidance of three-quarter fixed versus floating. Our maturity profile is well spread over time and our liquidity profile remains strong with 3.2 billion of undrawn committed credit lines in July 
We increased the size of outstanding bilateral credit lines for additional 400 million euro at very competitive cost, well below conditions prevailing uh, in the market, and extended the average life maturity uh, from one and a half to three years. Regarding our pool banking facilities, we are working to extend by one year the maturity of this facility, which were signed at competitive cost last December. We're now pleased to answer any question you may have. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please signal by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you're using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is switched off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. Again, please press star 1 to ask a question. We'll pause for just a moment to allow everyone an opportunity to signal for questions. We can now take our first question. It comes from Harry Weibert of Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Your line is open, sir. Please go ahead. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, two questions from me, please. Uh, so just firstly, on the new regulator uh, board, um, I had a quick read over the candidates. They, they seem to be uh, relatively uh, technocratic and, and apolitical, as far as I saw. But do you have any early views on, on the new regulatory board and whether you think that's going to produce any... Uh, change in policy or behaviour. Uh, and then secondly, you've upgraded your guidance slightly. Um, I presume, but could you confirm that, that you're still assuming a cut in the allowed uh, uh, return in uh, January? And if that uh, turns out actually to be flat or even uh, an increase in the allowed return because of the change in spreads, uh, that would trigger presumably another uh, potential upgrade to your earnings. And if that happens, would that be material enough to, to free up a little bit of extra balance sheet? And if the answer to that is yes, then, then how would you look to use that extra balance sheet? Thank you. Okay, so uh, I think you're right. I think the profiles are, are high, and uh, there's one candidate of the new regulatory board coming from internal, uh, from, coming from inside the regulator. So. Uh, we, we haven't, uh, of course, engaged as we wait for the par parliamentary process to formally appoint them, but I, w I would share your thought. They, s they seem to be apolitical, well-prepared, and always keep in mind that this regulator's task has been expanded over the years, so it needs to include capabilities for uh, water and waste management, so it's quite a broad regulator. Uh, coming to the guidance, just to be precise, the uh, increase in guidance is related to uh, 2018. Um, as I said, looking at the market today and looking at the future WAC, we expect there's a reason to be uh, more optimistic than our previous guidance, which, which does not impact 18, of course. And we think we can now look at a situation where we are at least uh, in line with today's WAC. The, what we do with that uh, incremental uh, flexibility or liquidity, I think we just always revert ba back to our policy, which is a generous uh, distribution of, of returns to shareholders uh, and managing the financial flexibility that we already have on our balance sheet. So I don't expect much change in that perspective. Thank you. Thank you. We can now move along to our next question. It comes from Javier Suarez of Medio Banca. Your line is open. Please go ahead, sir. Uh, hi. Good afternoon. Um, um, three questions on my side uh, and are uh, related to the slide number nine and on the guidance. So new guidance for net income is uh, around 1 billion euros in 2018. If you can unravel the reason for the increase in the guidance, in the guidance what is behind and the reasons why uh, the, the upgrade has, been, has happened. Or is that just a function of reduction in financial expenses or there is something more uh, to be considered there? Then also on the guidance, uh, can you give us the number of net debt by the year end, excluding uh, the acquisition of DESFA, uh, other acquisition on, uh, related to energy transition and the survey back already implemented, and you can quantify the positive effect uh, coming from working capital in 2018. I'm just uh, uh, trying to make my mind on the underlying number that compares with the 11.5 billion euros that you gave in the previous guidance. 
And the third question is on, on TAP. Obviously, uh, there is a new administration in Italy, and there has been some conflicting uh, comments on, on TAP. Uh, I, just wa- I just wanted to, uh, to have your latest view on the, uh, on the possibility that uh, TAP may suffer any uh, delay uh, beyond the expected, uh, the, uh, the expected timing for the project. Many thanks. Thank you, Javier. I'll take the last question and leave Alessandro to give you the breakdowns of, of the guidance. Uh, as, I, as I said, I think we can at this stage confirm the 2020 uh, first gas for TAP. I think the uh, decision also by EBRD uh, to support uh, with a positive vote, including one from the government of Italy, is a, is a positive development for TAP. And um, I think we have, of course, to continue to work, and TAP has to continue to work locally, as the government has repeatedly said, uh, to find a solution to the problems which are more local problems than central problems. So I think it's a positive development also on that front, and we have to continue to uh, increase the dialogue with the communities and reassure them that the pipeline doesn't pose any health risks or any environmental risks. So I think this is where we will spend the following months, including the summer months. Ale, over to you. Javier, on on the guidance on the net net income, the increase is due to a number of factors. Number one, uh, an increase on revenues um, uh, related to uh, some good performance uh, on uh, on volumes uh, that we have uh, experienced, as well as uh, on the storage capacity. Uh, Some progression which is faster than expected on, on cost saving, that are coming for, uh, forward in 2018 versus 2019, as well as a lower cost of debt. So effectively, you have approximately 10 million of uh, lower cost of debt, uh, slightly more than 10 million on revenues, and the rest effectively is, uh, is some uh, improvement on, on cost saving, um, as well as uh, some uh, better mix and manage of uh, labor cost uh, um, related to how we are um, taking uh, care of uh, uh, pre-retirement uh, um, exits as well as uh, uh, new um, hires with the different mix in terms of age and, uh, and, uh, and, and mix, really. But when it comes to the net debt, uh, I think our guidance of 11.5 billion includes approximately 100 million of uh, uh, structural uh, working capital uh, improvement by year end which we expect to, uh, to, re- to attain. Acquisitions are in the uh, best far uh, as we have uh, effectively com- almost completed the financing. The cash out is going to be around 120 million for our stake. And uh, uh, it's public what we paid for all the energy transition transaction we've done, which is likely less than, than 40 million. Um, on the buyback, uh, the number that is included in the guidance is what has been executed up until last Friday, which is 67 million. So, effectively, these are the components that uh, bring you to the uh, overall improvement in, in the guidance. And the true up of TAP is included in the, into that guidance, right? Yes, yeah, absolutely, but that was also the case back in the prior guidance, so there is no change there. Absolutely, yes, is included by your end. And, and you are not expecting any delay in the true up of TAP uh, related to, you know, all the... Uh, uh, difficulties or uh, political discussion, et cetera, et cetera. So you are still uh, thinking and maintaining as, as a guidance that the true up of TAP is going to be completed during the second half of 2018, right? Yes, correct. Uh, we are uh, currently negotiating with commercial banks uh, uh, the term sheet on the financing. We are looking to uh, finalize commitment uh, very shortly and work on finalization of documentation in the fall. Fantastic. Many thanks. Thank you. Uh, we can now move along to our next question. It comes from in- Enrico Bartoli of Maine First. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon, and first for taking my question. I have three of them, too. And uh, the first one is related to the uh, project for the methanization of Sardinia. If you can uh, uh, update us on uh, any discussion that you are having uh, with the government, uh, there were some articles on the press uh, that there is some uh, interaction between the local authorities and the, go- and the government about this project. So uh, what is your feeling uh, about uh, the possible risk that could be some uh, delays there? Um, a second uh, uh, question is related back to uh, to TAP. If you 
can uh, give us a hint of, um, let's say, the portion of your uh, investments uh, in uh, the 4.6 billion in transport in uh, your current business plan, uh, which are uh, related to the fact that the 10 BCM from TAP uh, will, uh, will flow to Italy over the next years. And uh, um, the last one is uh, on, uh, on the cost of debt. If you can uh, uh, please repeat or give some more details on the reason of uh, the reduction in your uh, guidance for the cost of debt uh, for this year. And uh, um, if you can give us a, a hint of uh, the evolution of the cost of debt for next year and 2020 that you would expect considering the current uh, forward curves uh, in the interest rate market. Thank you. Okay, I will take uh, the first two and uh, and let Ale to the second, uh, to the third. The on Sardinia, we have I think as I mentioned, we've signed this agreement, so there's now only one project that we've converged towards, which is a positive development. We have uh, an agreement with the regulator uh, to conduct uh, the engineering and the preliminary studies, so we are already spending some money on on this. The project does require additional approvement, approvals. It requires the single authorization and the environmental impact assessment, which has to be given by the government, and needs to, re and needs to pass a cost-benefit analysis, which we've already conducted. And the benefit to Sardinia of this pipeline is uh, very significant. It's around 250 million euros per year, uh, based on our calculations, and this is due to the switch uh, mainly for heating. Uh, the people in Sardinia are now using GPL, which as you know is a lot more expensive than uh, methane. So there's a, I think, significant enough savings to justify a very positive approach from uh, the local territory. But uh, as all these projects, this requires still the, the two main approvals, which are the VIA and the Autorizzazione Unica. On, uh, on TAP, there are around slightly less than 200 million euros of infrastructure in the south, uh, a part of which would, would be necessary anyway because of the growing demands uh, in the south. So uh, I think that's the, that's the number uh, that we have in Sardinia, which we've already began uh, working on, and, and that's progressing well. I think there's good reaction from the territory, even if it's not far from TAP, because it's, we start at 55 kilometers north of TAP, the first interactions locally are, are positive with people volunteering uh, access to, to their private property uh, for laying of the pipe. Uh, on the cost of debt. As, we, as I said, when, when we looked at 2019, uh, the, the revision of the guidance from 1.8 to 1.6 is uh, related to the funding done already in the first part of the year. Um, the expiry of a very expensive uh, bond, which already was no factor in our, uh, in our expectation, and uh, a very proactive uh, uh, treasury management uh, activity, taking advantage of an abundant liquidity at, at uh, negative um, uh, terms. Um, the, when, when we look at the future, it's clear, clearly we have seen um, rates going down, but spread going up. Uh, so we will clearly have a, a longer-term uh, view on what are the appropriate rates for our plan when we uh, come back in November. But overall, I think it's important to remind uh, that we have a rollover of approximately two billion of, of bond expiring in 2000, between 2019 and 2021, which we expect to deliver, uh, given where the market is today, something more than 100, 100 basis points on average um, in terms of looking at new issues versus existing ones. Um, we will continue to do optimization of our treasury management as long as it is possible, i.e. as long as the banking system will continue to provide a liquidity at, this, uh, at these levels, uh, but also uh, keeping uh, a close look at our fixed portion of debt as at some point rates will go up, although the last six months haven't, haven't necessarily shown that. Thank you. Thank you. We can now move along to our next question. It comes from James Brandt of Deutsche Bank. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Hi. Good afternoon. Uh, two questions, please. Uh, the first is just on the uh, output-based incentives uh, that could be coming in from the next regulatory period. Are you beginning to get any feel for 
what they may look like and how material they may be. And obviously, I'm conscious of the fact that, that Turner for Electricity Transmission had some output incentives outlined earlier this year that were quite material. And I was wondering whether you were hopeful that maybe a similar kind of package might ultimately be uh, outlined for, for yourselves. And the second question is on um, some of the energy transition investments that you outlined in, in slide uh, eight. Obviously, the amount that you're spending in that area at the moment is not that material in a group uh, context, but I was wondering whether you could just give us an idea as to whether or not we should expect um, ongoing uh, outlays uh, of the kind of magnitude that we've seen this year of around 40 million a year, or, or maybe even more material, what we should expect going forward for investments in this area. Um, and uh, if there's any kind of, maybe you'll give this at your strategy plan, but any update in terms of uh, what these kind of activities, um, we should expect them to contribute in terms of profits. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So on the output base, uh, I th the, the areas that we're quite pleased to see in this, in this uh, consultation are uh, around safety. So uh, looking at how we keep the management of, of the infrastructure always as safe as possible, also to improve the, the resilience of the network. And then the market to facilitate new interconnections, development of new markets, supply diversification, the types of things of like price alignment, some of the things that we've been discussing before. And uh, in general, new services, I think, to increase the, always the liquidity and attractiveness of, of the PSB and improve the market functioning. I think there's some new areas linked to the environment, uh, and these have to do with CO2 uh, reduction and, importantly, methane emission uh, reductions. And, and I think the final area is around service quality. Uh, so I think there's a lot to work on. I, I really look forward to start engaging with the new board of the regulator. I think below the board at the technical level, they, they fully see the benefits of incentivizing us. And I think we've been jointly happy with the progress made so far uh, in shifting from a market that was not being balanced uh, using, using market instruments and was being balanced physically through Stodget to now a, a more uh, functioning market. So I think the progress made in the last 18 months is good. I think there's a lot of areas uh, that that uh, we see uh, that we can turn into additional revenue and, and, and profits. Uh, at the same time, making gas more and more uh, part of the solution uh, for the long-term decarbonization. Something like methane emissions is something that we are, are doing anyway, and so the ability to do that in, in the context of an incentive is uh, even more attractive. Then um, looking at investments, these investments, the, I, just, to, just to give you some more visibility, I think the cumulative uh, EBITDA for these investments in 2017 has been 8 million euros. So you're right in saying it's not material. I, I don't see us buying many more technology uh, companies. I think these three are good platforms that enable us to be more effective in proposing ourselves as um, enablers of the development of biomethane, which I think is a long-term enhancer of the value of our infrastructure, as well as an enabler of the development of CNG, which is, again, another enhancer of the value of our infrastructure. These are really part of a, a broader gas advocacy effort, but they are very profitable. Uh, not only because we acquired them at good terms, but also because the investments we're making in CNG, for example, which are backed by long-term contracts, give us an IRR, which is uh, greatly in excess of, of our regulated WAC. So what we try to do with these vehicles is to enter new segments, which can, can grow and meta reality. I think we will be talking more about this in November. An area which we, we are not excluding, but we're still evaluating is a possibility of investing in biomethane plants themselves. The downside here is that these are uh, small investments, but again, the upside is that the returns on a, let's say, contracted or tolling basis, so we wouldn't look at taking any commodity exposure, but the returns that you can get, especially if you access it with an integrated uh, technology solution like we have now with YES, I think could be very, very attractive. Uh, in terms of the energy efficiency. TEP is one of the leaders in the Italian 
ESCO market. I think the Italian market is very different from the UK and other markets in that these ESCOs are incredibly fragmented. So TEP could itself be uh, somewhat of an aggregator, but I, I wouldn't expect uh, too much uh, too much in this space. Yes, and Kubo uh, can also give us uh, an opportunity to grow internationally with um, SNAM Global Solutions. So there are markets where both biomethane and CNG are considered uh, very attractive and where we are already working with SNAM Global Solutions. So that's really the logic behind these. In terms of size, I think I, I, uh, I think it's it's early. We don't have a plan for for as I said for the biomethane part. But in terms of materiality, I think for a few years this is a type of uh, of exposure that we're we're seeking. Thanks so much. Can I just ask a really quick follow-up? Just the small-scale LNG would would that be something that would go into your RAB, or would that be a long-term commercial contracts no. if if you went ahead with that? For now, it's not part of the RAB. Uh, I wouldn't be, I mean, we would probably like to ask the regulator for some form of output-based incentives or some form of support for this sustainable mobility. We're asking for equal treatment, and I think the people on pushing for electric vehicles are asking for uh, significant subsidies and, and support for that. I think if, if the government decides to uh, support sustainable mobility, we would argue for uh, technological neutrality, and so there could be some incremental incentives for this. Uh, but the way we're modeling it right now is to locate these micro uh, liquefaction plants in uh, parts of Italy which are hard to access via barge or via truck or via train. Consider that now the market is very small, but it's being supplied from Barcelona or Marseille, uh, uh, which, which you can imagine, the logistics chain there leaves quite a lot of value, uh, even if, even including the cost of liquefaction, uh, for this. So that's that's the logic there. Great, thanks a lot. Thank you, James. Thank you. We can now move along to our next question. It comes from Bartek Kubicki of Society Generale. Please go ahead, sir. Hi, good afternoon. Just three questions from my side. First, on employment, I noted that in gas transportation business, employment declined by roughly 3% on a Q&Q Q &Q, quarter on quarter basis. So I wonder if this is sustainable, and this is one of the reasons why you have uh, increased your OPEC savings guidance. The second question will be on associates, whether we can uh, expect similar performance uh, in the second uh, half of this year. And the third question, uh, technical, would be on regulated, uh, regulatory WAC for 2019. We know uh, the country's premium will probably increase. We know that we can expect the leverage could change. We can expect the tax rate could change. But what is your, what is your view on expected inflation used in the, in the WAC uh, formula? And uh, whether you have, you have any guidance on that? Thank you very much. Okay, on the employment, no, I think uh, there's there's been some adjustment recently, but I, I think going forward we will need to, um, I, I think we're always targeting to be more efficient on our core business, uh, but I think we're quite efficient already. And as the core business itself grows and the uh, new businesses come come in, we actually need more people rather than less. And I think we also have an opportunity here, and part of our cost savings are actually linked to this. We have an opportunity to do some very selective insourcing. Over the years, I think the whole oil and gas industry went through a big cycle of outsourcing. And if you look at some of the outsourcing, especially on the IT side, you're actually uh, paying uh, service companies to execute work on a, on a recurring basis, which means you have less control on the quality of what they do and you end up paying more as they make a margin on these contracts. I think the same applies to some of the engineering that we pay. So I wouldn't focus on headcount numbers as a source of savings. I, I, we're focused more on uh, technologies and, and trying to do what we do now uh, in a more efficient way in reallocating some of those uh, resources that we have to the new and, and to the growth businesses. On the associates, if I'm not mistaken, I think the second half could, could be slightly better than the first half, but without too much change. 
On the WAC, I don't know, Al, if you want to comment on the we, we, expectation. Yeah, on the inflation expectation, we expect no change because ultimately the current uh, um, forecasts uh, um, that are relevant for the update are signaling the same one, approximately one and a half percent that uh, was was used back at the time. So we don't expect any 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 change from from that perspective. Thank you. Thank you. We can now move along to our next question. It comes from Anna Maria Scala of Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Hi. Good afternoon. It's Anna Maria. Just uh, two very quick questions. The first one is on uh, these acquisitions that you mentioned before, TAP, uh, Kubo, etc. Um, did you say they contribute? They expected to contribute eight million of EBDA from next year, or they are already contributing eight million of EBDA? If you can clarify, and also what is the revenue contribution expected? And the second question on Vespa: Can you confirm that uh, you expect to equity uh, consolidate the stake you are acquiring, and what could be the impact there as well? Thank you. So the, the figures for the acquisitions were related to 2017 full year for them. So it's not the impact on us because the closing has been uh, very recent of, of some of these. Uh, so 8 million of 2017 EBITDA for all three of them. Yes, uh, Kubogas uh, and TEP. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, around 75 million euros of revenue uh, for, the same, uh, for the same period. Uh, so you will see going forward uh, the costs increasing or, or linked to the costs associated with, with those revenues. In terms of DESFA, I think we, uh, we are now not expecting uh, to consolidate it. The equity contribution um, impact uh, for us would be a positive, around a positive 10 million euros. Yes, thank you. Anna Maria? Okay. Yeah, it's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you. As a reminder at this time, it's star one to ask a question today. We can now move along to our next question. It comes from Stefano Iamarini of Equeta. Your line is open. Please go ahead. Yes, good afternoon. Just a, a quick question regarding the slide number five, where there is this uh, uh, cost-benefit analysis that is included in the consultation paper um, issued by the regulator. Just if you can elaborate a little bit more about this, uh, uh, this consultation paper, if uh, this uh, could allow um, your company to accelerate investments, uh, considering that the benefits uh, uh, are mainly related to social welfare and uh, uh, security, which means that probably you can have a, a positive uh, valuation from this kind of analysis, or on the other side, uh, you see more risks uh, that uh, uh, new projects could be stopped uh, due to this new approach from the regulator. Thanks. I, I, thank you, Stefano. I see this as a very positive development because the methodology is uh, is a, uh, let's say, uh, best practice-based methodology, which is proved and tested also with ENSOG. And uh, I think previously we would be almost self-restraining ourselves based on perhaps more stringent, more stringent approach. 4% discount rate is, is a good discount rate. 25-year horizon is as expected. I think the ability to add the more social benefits and importantly, the, the ability to add security of supply concerns, especially when Europe is asking uh, all countries to undergo stress tests with the N-1 methodology, which means removing the biggest source, which in our case is Russia. Uh, this, I think, gives us a lot of room uh, to potentially have, have new developments. But I don't think our plan uh, as such will change. I expect that we will continue to be below the threshold that this new cost-benefit analysis could allow. So I think it's a, there's nothing magic here. There's nothing new. I think it's, it's quite rigorous, but also generous in its applicability and could potentially give room to more upside. And certainly none of our CapEx programs would be negatively impacted by this. 
just a, a quick follow-up, if I may, considering that you are bringing, for, bringing forward in the presentation of the new, the new business plan, could we expect some novelties mainly related to renewable gas or something else that uh, should be included in your new business plan in uh, November? That's, that's exactly what we're working on. I think the question we're asking ourselves is if, how, and how much we uh, would like to invest in biomethane. Uh, here we have a regulatory issue, so we would need to find a partner to provide a being totally unbundled to to sell to put commodity into into the market, uh, and that's a hurdle to overcome. And then we need to uh, decide really over the next few weeks uh, what appetite we have uh, for partnering with uh, uh, people managing local waste uh, with long-term contracts. I think that's 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 what we would like to share with you in November. Okay, many thanks. Thank you. We have no further questions at this time, so I will now hand the call back to the speakers for any additional or concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you. I think we covered a lot of ground. As always, our IR team is available for any follow-on questions, and uh, look forward to talking uh, over the next few months and uh, meeting again in November. Thank you.